It's January 2020. I'm nearing the end of my Christmas break and it's my birthday and everything's great. The days are long and sunny. The birds are singing in the trees. Espresso flows freely from the nozzles of baristas directly into my mouth. And there's only one black cloud hanging over me. And that's the thought of going back to my soul draining remote job. And I said to myself, Tom, you know what? You don't have to go back. You can resign and you can spend your time making an intricate programming puzzle that for some reason Germans really like. And then later in the year, if you feel ready, you know, you can go get an office job again. What's the worst that could happen? Um, so that was January of 2020. And then two months later, the premier of Victoria tells Victorians to expect extreme measures due to the uh, rapid spread of the pandemic. And uh, shortly afterwards, we begin a series of lockdowns that we all know and love. Um, I was happily unemployed at that point still when a friend sort of tricked me into applying for a job. And I always tell people don't apply for one position at a time. You should apply for multiple, get multiple offers. You'll do better that way. So that's what I did. Um, I was interviewing at a few different places and I noticed that the process had changed a little bit compared to before the pandemic. Now there's this thing called a live coding interview where you join a Zoom call on your own computer and you share your screen and the interviewers feed you tasks which you implement in front of them while they watch. Which brings us to the topic of this talk, Nailing the Live Coding Interview, an opinionated guide for Rubius featuring Adam Rice, which I hope you're ready, Adam. <laughs> uh, not to blow my own bugle, but I think that I did fairly well in my live coding interviews. So this talk is basically me taking the things that I think work for me, and I'm trying to add in some justification for why I think they work well and packaging it up into a rough game plan that you can use in your own interviews if you so desire. Um, so let's start with like the goal. If you're interviewing at this place, then uh, ostensibly you would like to get hired. That's one of the goals that you're going for. But you should also be aware that this interview is one of the factors that's going to determine how much you get paid. So Performing well will get you a higher salary at the end. Um, so yeah, our goal is to get hired and to make some fudge at the at the same time. Um, so in order to do that, in order to do well in the interview, we have to kind of know what we're being evaluated on by the interviewers. And I would say it boils down to basically these two things. One, they want to see what's your level of technical ability and two, they want to see what your communication skills are like. And I think that the second one is maybe a little bit neglected. Like you might think, oh, I have to show them how good I can write code. But um, I think a lot of what interviewers are looking for are actually communi communication skills. It's maybe about like 50-50. So knowing what you're being evaluated on and what we're going for, uh, this is the strategy I'm going to recommend, the like generic strategy which is to show green flags to the interviewers. Uh, green flags is something that I came up with off the top of my head, which probably someone else has already come up with, but it's the opposite of a red flag. A red flag is an indication that makes the interviewer think, hmm, maybe, maybe this person wouldn't be good for the job. So a green flag, it's like a, it's like a little notification popping up in their mind going, hey, that's good, that was nice. Like they might be good at their job. And that's the goal. We're going to try to show as many of these green flags as possible. And this is this is the rough game plan, the, the six step plan that I'm recommending for people. Um, after being given the task at the start, the very first thing that we're going to do is build a project directory from scratch with RSpec. Um, after RSpec is all set up and working, we're going to do a specification, so a spec file with no actual implementations of the test. We're just going to treat it like a to-do list, basically, uh, in the BDD fashion. Um, once that's written and we've sort of run it past the interviewers and got a bit of feedback, uh, we're going to pick one of those unimplemented examples and write the test for it. Uh, again, run it past the interviewer. 
then we're going to make it pass using our editor doing like tricky things that make us look good basically and then it's rinse and repeat until all of the pending examples are done and everything's implemented so adam I, are you with us i am with you hi tom it's uh hi. it's really nice to meet you um Lovely everyone to i've spoken too. to they tell me you're a 10xer and so uh i'm super excited to see what you can do yeah thanks um, uh where where am i applying to again uh, uh this... fizzbuzz co fizzbuzz co. okay right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah nice yeah that's yeah, right you've probably yeah. heard of us yeah We're yes real i big. have i have yeah yeah, yeah. um Today, uh, today, we have a, a, a bit of a, a live challenge for you. What we'd like you to do is uh, write a program that prints the numbers from one to 100. But for any of those numbers that are a multiple of three, we would like you to print the word fuzz, fizz, sorry. And instead, if the number is a multiple of five, we'd like you to print the word fuzz. And then for numbers which are multiples of both three and five, we'd like you to print fizz buzz. Does that all make sense? Yeah, I think it does. Um... Thank you, Adam. Um, so freeze. First step that we're going to do is we're going to create this project directory from scratch, which is basically a Ruby version file to specify what version of Ruby the project runs in, the gem file, then we're going to bundle install, get our spec all set up, and we'll make like uh, an empty spec file. All right. This is the live coding section. Um, also, I'm going to time myself in this for reasons that will become apparent a little bit later. Okay. I'm going to make a fizz buzz, duh. move into that one. Uh, we're going to do 2.7 because I think that's what's installed here. Uh, open up the gem file. We only want our spec with this gem file. Install the gems. That looks good. Initialize our spec so it spits out that spec helper. Uh, I'm going to turn on some of the suggested settings, which are commented out at the moment, just because I think they're, they're good defaults, except for this one here, profile examples, which just clutters up the screen when I'm trying to run tests. Uh, and then let's write fizz buzz spec. Our spec will describe fizz buzz. And we're just going to leave it empty for the moment. So that fails because fizz buzz doesn't exist, obviously. So if we require fizz buzz, no such file. And if we make that file, Hopefully this works now. Oops. Okay, so test is passing. Stop the timer. It says uh, one minute thirty-eight, so under two minutes. Um, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so just created the project directory from scratch. Why do we do that? Well, the green flags we're trying to show is that um, the you understand the command line, like you're very comfortable on it. You understand Ruby tooling, like RSpec and Bundler, and you understand how like Ruby projects are set up in general. These are all like really good things to be showing to the interviewer. On to step two, we're going to outline a BDD specification. This is the to-do list that I was talking about of the of the um, functional requirements of the task. So I'm going to pop back into here. So Adam, uh, you said that it outputs the numbers from 1 to 100. That is correct, yep. And then it was for multiples of 3, you do fizz. Um, Absolutely right. Outputs fizz for multiples of 3. And then it was buzz for 5. And fizzbuzz for 15. For three and five. Yes. So this is the rough plan of what I'm 
going to test uh, if if all of these like behaviors existed is that have i missed anything are these all of the requirements this uh this looks great to me yep awesome thank you i actually wrote that line for him to say in the in the script so thank you adam um so the green flags that we're trying to show in this particular step are that um we actually listen when we're told the task and we don't just jump straight into the code. We're actually trying to understand the problem and make sure that we've um, make sure that we've understood it basically before writing code. Uh, it also shows that we have like a system. We're not just writing random code here and there. Like we obviously uh, have an approach that has a set of steps and that makes you look organized. And I also think that doing it this way, um, not a lot of people know you can write pending tests. I should actually just show that quickly. If I run this file, for example, zero failures for pending, um, you can just do these tests with no bodies as like a to-do list. Um, and that to me sort of indicates that maybe this person who's writing these specs is like pretty good at testing. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely a green flag for me when I'm uh, interviewing people. All right, step number three is that we're just going to pick one of these tests and implement it. So let's do the first one. Uh, so let's say I want to get the FizzBuzz output, I guess. Describe class.outputs, the outputs with an S because it's going to be an array. And I sort of want the first output to equal one. And well, let's let's check the whole thing. Expect outputs to equal one up to 100. So this is just all the numbers, one to 100, uh, and make an array. So outputs the numbers from one to 100. We expect the outputs, which I have not done up here. Outputs, expect the outputs to equal this array of strings from one to 100. Uh, that's kind of what we expect. So, uh, to, before we go into reviewing like whether that's a good test or not, um, the reason why we're just picking one of these, not writing all the tests up front, is that I think it shows that you understand iterative development. It means that you can take, take a task or a problem, you can break it down into like the behaviors that are required for that problem to be considered like done. And you can do them piecemeal one at a time. I think that's a, I think that's a green flag for sure. And it also shows that you sort of take TDD and testing seriously. All right, so the fourth step is we're gonna go back to that test and just talk about it with Adam, the interviewer. All right, so does this look, does this look right, Adam? Is this how I understood the requirement properly? Okay, uh, I like the direction. Are the outputs supposed to be numbers? Uh, some of them are supposed to be numbers, but yeah, they're not all supposed to be numbers, are they? Like there's gonna be fizzes and buzzes in here. So this, this example is actually wrong. Um, so let's change this. It, so it's outputs, it starts at one, I guess. And then we also have another requirement that it um, outputs, it has 100 outputs. Maybe that's a better way to, to describe it. So if you get the first output, we expect that to be a one. And then this one, uh, outputs dot size to equal 100. So that's kind of the same thing. It's going from one to 100, but it's, it's allowing the fizzes and the buzzes to be in the, in the output values. Does that look better? Yeah, I think that looks great. Yeah, awesome.
All right, so the reason that we would like to run the test past the interviewer first is that like A, it's showing you're collaborative and that you can um, take feedback. Um, but also, like if you make a mistake, if, if you haven't understood something in the question, you know, you're under pressure, it's, it's going to happen. Um, it's good to check beforehand before you go down a rabbit hole and waste a lot of time. So that's also just a useful thing for you. Uh, but the second thing that allows you to do is show off your design skills a little bit. Um, I probably didn't do an amazing job of that here, but some of the things that uh, you could be talking about is just like the naming. So the FizzBuzz module here, um, I'm calling a method on it called outputs. Um, that this could be a class, like maybe it should be .new.outputs. Uh, you should sort of talk about that stuff. Um, also, why is this, this one here a string instead of an integer? So it could easily just be that. Those sort of things are good to talk about. Um, and just for your reference, uh, because fizz, is, fizz and buzz are going to be strings, I think that the numbers should also be strings because then you have an array of only strings instead of an array of integers and strings. That's the sort of thing that you'd want to be bringing up uh, with the interviewers to show you have design skills. And then lastly, now we actually start writing the implementation. Um, this is, we've written the test first, so it's a TDD workflow. And I think in this step, what you want to do is you want to try show off the, the things that you know, um, the things that would indicate that you can actually write Ruby proficiently. Um, some suggestions for what those are. I think if you're comfortable in uh, Bybug or Pry, it's good to whip them out if you're debugging something. Uh, the way you look up documentation, like RI on the command line is, is one way to do it. You might also have, um, what's that app called? Is it Dash? That's pretty popular as well. Uh, whipping out Dash and showing that you know how to use that, that's good. And just your knowledge of the Ruby language in the standard library. Um, you want to demonstrate things in there that maybe aren't that common um, to show that you, you know what you're doing. And let's jump into that one. Okay. So we've got two failing tests, undefined method outputs for FizzBuzz. Let's run the test again. Undefined method first for nil class. We're not returning an array. Expected 100 and got zero. So let's do that one. Array, I just implement it at this point. I will go one, two, 100, turn it into an array. All right. Five examples, zero failures, three pending. Those two are passing now. So why are we, what are we trying to show here? A, uh, we wanna show that you as a developer are fast and efficient. Um, it's really good to have your development environment set up and configured in a way that you have all your hotkeys and stuff necessary. If you're in VS code, install the, uh, the R spec plugin thing that lets you do that quickly, um, stuff like that. You just want to show that this is completely normal for you. This is where you spend most of your day sort of thing. And it's it's not a problem to write Ruby that fast. Uh, it also just shows that you're good at writing code in general, I guess. Uh, it should seem like fairly natural. And the advantage is you're working on your own computer. So you can set up everything ahead of time exactly how you want it. Um, so definitely make use of that to just make it seem as natural as possible. Then we're just going back to step three. We're going to run through a, another one of the examples and do all those steps again, which I'll do just one more time. So you can see the whole thing without me chopping in between all the steps. So I'm going to take just the next one, outputs fizz for multiples of three. So let's just take a look at a few of these outputs. The third should be fifth, and the uh, sixth should be fifth. Is that right, Adam? So number three and number six should be fifth, correct? That is correct, yes. Alrighty. So we got the string three, we're expecting fizz. Let's fix that up.
and call this n for number because I don't have a, a better name for it. And now the tricky part is I want to check if n is divisible by three, but these are strings. So I'm going to have to turn these strings back into integers. And if n modulo three is zero, then we want this. Otherwise, we're going to do n. And what does that look like? Okay, that one passes. But if I run the rest of the tests, expected a string got an integer. So let's just turn this into a string. Oh, nice. So they all pass. Um, yeah, that is it for that bit. So that's one of the advantages of actually having the um, having the test there. We, you could easily just have written this in a single Ruby file and run it from the command line. But uh, the next thing that's going to happen in the, in the interview is that there's going to be follow-up questions. And they go, OK, extend it to do this, extend it to do that. And it's very easy to break the stuff that was working before. So that's, that's one reason that the test suite is really nice to have in there. So just to sort of summarize and add a couple of extra tips, um, you're being evaluated on your technical ability and your communication skills. So on the technical side, I recommend that you use this BDD workflow where you're sort of making that to-do list of um, specifications that you're gonna run down later and doing test first development basically. Um, the other thing that I hope was apparent is that you should have like a development environment, your editor or whatever you're using uh, be very polished. Like it should look smooth as you're working as much as possible. Um, that just sort of, there's a lot of green flags just to do with that, watching someone work uh, in a comfortable way. And then uh, the other thing that I'd say is that you should know the language, like uh, brush up on the features of the language, the standard library and the common gems. It's really easy to get comfortable with sort of the bits that you know and not really branch out, but it is a really good thing to actually show um, if you can show the interviewer something that they didn't know before about the language, maybe like it came out in Ruby three and they haven't caught up with it yet. That's awesome. You should be looking to do that sort of thing. And on the communication side, uh, listen carefully to the, to the um, task that's been given and also the, the feedback that you've been given. Um, I think it's important to run through with the interviewer and clarify exactly what the requirements are before jumping into the code. Uh, I think that's maybe like a bit of a trap is to just start writing code straight away. And if the interviewer does give you feedback, they won't always, sometimes they, they want to um, just see what you come up with. They don't want to lead you and, and um, give you, give you hints basically that would push you down a certain direction. They just want to see what you come up with naturally. But if they do give you feedback, I think that you should, you should take it seriously. Like they're not asking you a question for no reason, if they say, hmm, should those be all numbers? They already know the answer. They don't want, they don't want you to ask the question. They're, they're seeing how you respond to feedback. So make sure that you do respond to feedback well. And the other thing that I was trying to show is that as you're making decisions in your head, writing code, you should just be like talking to yourself and narrating your choices. Um, that sort of ties into the interviewers will be silent a lot of the time they don't want to lead you on so if you can't talk to them about like is this right or should i do it this way or that way you have to talk to yourself um, this is really good in a few different ways because a it shows that you do communicate a lot like it's not going to be hard to uh, work with you you're not going to go away for a week be silent and then pop out and not have anything to show for it sort of thing which does happen sometimes with developers um, and also what it's good for is if you make a decision as you're writing code that the interviewer thinks is maybe not the best and you don't explain your reasoning behind it, they might just assume that you don't know what you're doing or something like that. Whereas if you do explain your reasoning behind something, then it's more likely that the interviewer will go, oh, that seems reasonable and it won't be like held against you. All right, well, I'll, I'll finish on a story first. Uh, 
So the reason why I timed myself with that aspect setup was that back when I was interviewing um, in 2020, I got into the interview, we said, hello, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. I got given the task. And the first thing I said was, um, so I guess I'll just install aspect really quick and get the um, test suite up and running. And the interviewers both sort of went silent for a second and they looked at each other in the Zoom call. And the, the most senior one goes, hmm, well, if you think that's the best thing to do, then yeah, um, sure, go, go ahead and install Aspect. But, you know, we have a limited amount of time. And if it's going to take you, like, we're going to be installing Aspect the whole time. We might not have, have time to complete the task. So, yeah, just, just keep that in mind. Um, and I was like, yeah, easy. Uh, just went in, what was it, under two minutes. Um, I think that was a really good thing to do because, uh, A, you're like, they expect you to be slow and then you show them that you're fast. That's awesome. And then B, you've done all this extra work. Like you've got a whole test suite running and the project set up and all of that stuff, which if you had have just made a single Ruby file, you didn't have an exam, you didn't have an opportunity to show all those green flags. But by setting up the whole project, it didn't take that long. In fact, I think it's probably the fastest way to do the, the whole um, interview thing. It's because with the test suite and you're running it really fast with hotkeys um, and it will detect if you make a mistake in the future, like follow-up questions. Uh, I think that actually makes you go way faster than fiddling around with a single file and going and running it from the command line. Um, so that's it. Uh, if you would like to not do a live coding interview, then please speak to us at Zepto because we're hiring and we actually do a take-home interview. So this isn't like super helpful for applying to us, but we have multiple Ruby engineering positions available and uh, we were looking to hire nine and I think we've got about five at the moment. So there's, there's a few left and they're going fast. Um, I think what we're looking for and what I, who I'd like to work with is uh, people who are responsible, considerate, and who work well with autonomy. So we're a fully remote company and we've been remote since before the pandemic even hit. And uh, yeah, we, we like to give teams a lot of uh, freedom to define how they work. And if that sounds good to you, then please email me, tomadzepto.com.au. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any questions from the audience? Where's the crowd? How did I how did I do, Adam? Am I hired? Yeah, I, I, the, the question we're all waiting for is he hired? <laughs> there is there is unquestionably a great junior role in our organization for you. <laughs> oh, <thank> you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and what's my salary? <laughs> uh, I don't. I'm gonna talk to Nadia about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's gonna be in the. I, I hear from Nadia. It's gonna be in the two hundreds. So. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> $200 a year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that was, uh, that was really good. And I definitely agree with, with everything. I thought that was a really good demonstration of how to do live coding. So well done. Thank you. That's, uh, it's that's, actually uh, me. uh, I don't have a question. I have a comment, but I appreciate that comment. Thank you. <laughs> that's the first time I've seen someone do, um, Fizz buzz with uh, strings for the numbers. And I, I really appreciated that consistency in the response. Yeah, I, I think it's important. If if you would like to read way too many words on FizzBuzz, I do have an article about FizzBuzz <laughs> in too much detail. If you if you Google FizzBuzz, I think it's on the first page. You will no find it. I, I like the um how do you call it? Like the peer presentation, bringing in, bringing in an extra peer that was uh, added a bit of dynamism to it. Yeah, I wrote I wrote down everything Adam had to say except for which company am I applying to, and you, you handled it well. I was going to say, <laughs> is it is it Rice Tech? 
is, is this is where I admit to the fact that um, as your talk was starting, I was freaking out because my computer over started overheating and I was on a three second lag. I had to shut all the apps, open the windows, get oh, the fan on. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's cool. We just lie. play this out. We'll play this out. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tom, a couple of comments, questions. Yes, Michael. Um, good, good presentation. I'm a fan of everything you've done. I'm a fan of the BDD. I'm a fan of uh, things like being very comfortable in your environment. Um, but on your green flags and red flags, um, <clears throat> I suppose it's kind of interesting because you manually created the gem file, whereas you could have done a bundle space in it. So would that mm -hmm. then fire off a red flag for somebody to say, oh, he didn't know how to set up bundle automatically. Um, I suppose the bigger question for me is, uh, and I have been recently um, looking at jobs, and I'm actually going to be joining you at Zepto. Uh, uh, but um, what I noticed with a lot of coding interviews is there are a whole heap where they give you predefined tests, uh, right? So there's there's some failing tests, and you just got to go and go a million yeah. miles an hour to try and solve them. And it's kind of hard to know how many they expect you to solve. Um, the other one I've noticed is one where they just ask you to do quite a lot in a very short period of time. And, and in, in one example, one, I mean, it was in JavaScript, which is a little bit kind of different. I, I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be as comfortable setting up tests that quickly in JavaScript. Yeah. Um, but in this case, it was uh, create a fake server, make 10 requests asynchronously, make sure that they all kind of merge magically. And it was just like, what? How the hell do you do that? Uh, so to me, it was difficult to try and solve the problem first at all, uh, let alone mm -hmm. to just say, right, I'm just going to write some tests on mm. some fake server that's going to respond to 10 requests asynchronously, et cetera. Um, so I don't know, is there, did you come across those kind of tests? Is there any, any, uh, any hints you have for those, those kind of approaches? Um, I didn't. All the ones that I did were relatively small plain Ruby sort of tasks. They weren't, weren't even Rails, um, which I, I kind of feel is well suited to just that format. You only have 45 minutes or an hour. And if you give someone like stand up some web server that does blah, 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 that may be like a bit too much to do in that amount of time. Um, yeah, this is, this is definitely geared towards a certain kind of live coding interview. And I'm not 100% sure how it would work for for something that you can't wrap a, a test around easily. Mm. So if you're writing, if you write, have to write some sort of test against an external web server, so you're doing Selenium or whatever, then yeah, I guess it pays to be like really on the ball with Selenium. So you can set that up very quickly, but you kind of have to know that's coming. Um, yeah, I don't have any, any good answers, sorry. If you, if you did, if you were able to stand up a Selenium test suite very quickly, I think that might still be the best way to go because if you're, you still have to capture the requirements, right? Like hopefully you can write a list of it must do A, B, C, D. If you can get that in some form of test, then um, at least you've got something you can run repeatedly to make sure uh, that it's working sort of mm. thing. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of with, with you on that one and I mean, that's my style of coding. So it's my style of jobs that I end up ending up in. Ones that more important about get, get some requirements, write them down, write some tests against them. Uh, and certainly I have, I have seen interviews like that, which, which work really well with, with the Aspect Ruby style of coding. But as I said, I have seen other companies that have literally just said, show us how, how many amazing patterns you can do off the top of your head, you know, recursive programs, all sorts of stuff. Mm. Mm. yeah yeah I, I mean i i did want to keep this specific to ruby because you're more likely to run into something you can wrap in aspect or maybe they give you a rails project and you have like you know a set of tests like system tests and um request specs and unit specs that you might be more familiar with they wouldn't be too hard to spin up but yeah i can definitely see other languages this being not the the best approach I would generally uh, establish some uh, uh, how how the process will go. Uh, so some some understanding with with the interview about about how it'll go, as in like 
um, look, I could Google stuff in front of you, but um, yeah. would you prefer I just ask you? Like, mm -hmm. okay, I don't know how to use, um, I know all about RSpec, but I don't know uh, what, uh, how to set up this JavaScript testing framework. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would you use? Uh, how do you do that? And, and then I'll, and then I'll like, you know, actually write the tests within that or whatever. Hmm. Well, sometimes they, they give you the test suite, like Michael was saying. So that should be totally fine. Is like, they'll probably help you get to the point where you can run that failing test suite, but at least you'd hope so. Yeah. And, and I um, <laughs> would, would establish at the start whether um, it would be representative of uh, real pairing because yeah, there's, there's a, can be a wide difference in, in interviews of like, is this actually going to be pair programming where we're like bouncing ideas over each other? Or is it like, you're going to be silent and just watch me? <laughs> yeah. I did the silent watch me variety, uh, but yeah, pair programming, I guess, I guess you, you could kind of feel it out. It depends on who's driving. If that, I guess it makes sense that the person being interviewed would be the driver of the pair programming. Otherwise you're just like, looking at someone that already works there and going, mm, yes, good decisions. I like that code. Yep. Keep going. Um, so yeah, in that case, you could still just set up aspect quickly, I guess, which is, which is nice, but yeah, it just depends on the situation. You're right. Uh, scoping out beforehand is a good idea. As, as an interviewer, I'd like to do it as, um, I'm a pretend I'm a junior, so I'm here to pair, but I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not going to lead the thing. I'm, I'm not going to come in with a lot of knowledge. So you have to sort of lead it and say, make the choices. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you think, uh, like, what would you chime in with in that situation? I think, I mean, stepping out of the, so there'd be certain things with the junior, like, why are you doing it this way? Uh, you know, what are the, what are the advantages of this way or that way? But occasionally I'll step out of that role if I feel like they're definitely going down the wrong path. Mm. Um, just Because, mm. you know, you want to give the candidate an opportunity to shine and you don't want to be stuck there for 30 minutes of them going down the wrong path. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. you try to direct them towards a good solution. That's what I think they were trying to tell me when they said aspect might take too long to install, which is like if, if I wasn't confident that I could install it very quickly, then definitely take that feedback. <laughs> uh, it was only because I knew it was an opportunity to, to show like, oh, they think I can't do it. This is going to be good sort of thing. <laughs> this is going to yeah. be a green flag for sure. Yeah. Do you, do yeah, you, just, just uh, on what Brendan was saying, it's kind of the difference between a pairing and a staring interview. Pairing um, I've staring. had some staring, staring interviews before. Yeah. Yeah. Blake? Do, do you prefer like a live coding interview or do you prefer a take-home task? Like, and do they I, either side? I prefer the live coding one simply because I can sort of rock up, do it in an hour and then it's over. Yeah. Whereas the take-home ones can be like, sometimes they want you to put in eight hours longer. One of the ones, take-home ones that I did was uh, make a production grade shopping cart in Rails. What the fuck? No. <laughs> really? It's like, yeah, you've got, shouldn't take longer than eight hours. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm like literally stopping at seven hours or whatever. And whatever's done by that point, like that's what they get. <laughs> I'm not going any further. So I prefer the life coding one, but there are definitely people who don't perform well, like very good engineers who just choke up in that situation. And it's probably good to give them an opportunity to, to do some sort of take home thing instead. Unless they're paying you for that eight, eight hours, that's a hard yeah. pass. Yeah. yeah, these these were long long ago times. the The developer salaries are so high now that they're just like, "Hey, do you have a GitHub? I'll just look at that, and then here's the job offer." So, <laughs> yeah, I don't well, think your, your GitHub power. should have a lot of great stuff in it for exactly. Yes, that. yes. Um, Tom, I absolutely love what you just laid out there that um thank you the, the stuff that i've come into um the interviews that i've come into without a sense of like knowing what i was going to be doing you know i'm sort of like paddling waiting to, to hit bottom um when i go into the interview process having this kind of framework would have given me a tremendous amount of confidence going into it so i think this is uh, a great framework to give people and 
I, I really hope that people who are interviewing are looking at this and saying, oh, okay, like, how can we start from a place like this? How can we like start from this talk as like a seed for like when, when we're going to interview someone and say, have you seen Tom's talk? Like, what we're hoping for is just generally that you can give us a sense that you, you know, you can hit the ground running with this kind of stuff because they're not really interested if you can install a gem. What they really want to know yes. is once you've got the gem installed, um, how you go. Yeah. So, yeah. Way. Sorry, you go. No, no, you go, Nadia. I was just going to say, yeah, thanks, Tom. That was a great talk uh, and great interviewer as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was even if you can't, yeah, if you get in there and it's like, oh, here's already the RSpec suite, do this other thing that we already had in mind for you and you really were totally blindsided. I feel like most of the strengths, I mean, that's a big part of being able to flex your environment, but I think a lot of the other parts of the talk are just as relevant still. Like you can still get in there and flex your BDD skills. You can get in there and you just, I also just think that interviews are an hour of you flexing and flexing really well and flexing really hard and flexing every muscle you've ever owned and ones you yeah. didn't own. Um, yeah. So you can still get in there and clarify like the information that they've given you. It's like, do you really, do you want me to run this spec first or this spec first? And, uh, and yeah, do everything else basically. Yeah, I feel like with what I was sort of getting at with the green flags is that you know your own strengths and if you can shove in every one of your own strengths into that 45 minutes to an hour interview, like that gives you your best chance. And that's sort of what you're trying to do. So yeah, definitely um, take stock of what you're good at and try to highlight those. Communication skills are uh, so incredibly important. I yeah. strongly feel that you could walk into an interview and not write a line of code and not, and you can say, I don't, no to almost every question they ask and on the strength of the way that you engage with them about the technical things they're talking about like you know oh i'm interested in you know that particular thing oh i've worked on this similar sorts of thing you know there's there's a tremendous space there available still to to communicate your savvy and your confidence and your, your awareness of the technical challenges um and without writing a line of code without you know knowing the specific technical things they're talking about in any part of it, you could still come out of that saying with a demonstration of, you know, I know Ruby, I know um, how to approach a technical challenge. I'm excited to learn more about the challenge you're putting in front of me. I, you know, yeah. I can learn, I can, I can respond to a technical challenge. Yeah, so writing this, uh, when I was coming up with like the technical and communication, those are the, like the two halves that you're trying to hit. Um, it did occur to me, like, what if there's something that you want to do, like, you want to ask a question that might make you look dumb, basically. So it's, it's going to give you a hit in the technical department, but potentially it actually looks good in the communi communication side, like that you're asking questions and you can, um, you're not going to pretend that you know something you don't know, which could be a big red flag. And I think that that is the case that I, everyone that I've spoken to and myself, I would much rather someone ask a question if they don't know it. And I don't, I don't really hold it against them for not knowing a particular thing. Like maybe, maybe it is like sort of indicative of their skill level, but it looks really good to say, Hey, I don't know how to do this thing. Like, what should I do here? That's that uh, is a, a green flag, a big green flag in the communication department. So I would say, lean towards that rather than um, trying to like salvage the technical side. Yeah, I definitely feel like in interviews, I've, I don't use the word punished, but I definitely feel like I have graded somebody very poorly when they haven't asked me something and got it wrong, as opposed to somebody that went, does Ruby do this? And I just said, yes or no. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, you can, I always say like, you can always teach people programming but it's very hard to teach someone like an attitude. So you're looking for the good attitude mostly, yeah. I think this is very company dependent. I think some companies for their interview process have a sort of a hurdle where you have to get so far into the coding. We have to show something in the coding to, to even be in consideration. So, I mean, I would, like it's, it's a balance. You've got to show the communication, you've got to show the, uh, your willingness to ask questions and say you don't know things, but you, you do actually have to tick a few boxes in the technical world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, 
Oh, so go on top. Oh, I was just going to say, that, like, the attitude is really important, but you don't hire people for purely attitude. It's like attitude plus <laughs> the the like skill level that they're at. Yeah. Yeah, I like um, like that kind of conversation. Like, sort of brings you back to um what Brendan was saying about uh engaging you know with them and, and going okay I don't know how to do this thing I can google it or you know show me and just like you're checking in with what they want to see from you and if they want to do more of that pairing style then they're probably going to jump in at that point or they might go like no show me how you would figure it out you know especially if you're playing that role of like I'm a junior and I want to see how you um you know like you see like um I want to see how you would engage with the junior if that's important to that company then that's a really interesting thing, you know, to measure and you can go, okay, great. We need to do this. I'm not really sure we can figure it out together. Mm. Um, I had a question, Tom, um, which yeah. is that like, so this, um, you know, is really about like how to make sure that you kind of shine and show all these green flags and all of those sorts of things. I was curious if you had some thoughts about how like through this process, how you're also doing like your side of, you know, that interview and getting what you need out of it in testing, you know, the, the company and trying to figure out whether you want to work for that, for those people, for those people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I kind of view particularly like the live coding interview as a fairly one-sided part. Like uh, ideally you're having other interviews, right? Like where you do get to, interview the company a bit more, ask them about like how, how working there is and things like that. This one, yeah, I, I feel is very one-sided. It's them evaluating you, um, but you can definitely get a feel for like how they treat you basically. So if, if they are pairing with you and you're asking them questions and they're being, I don't know, like maybe you're getting like this mild feeling of disrespect, something like that, that's probably a bit of a red flag um, mm. for them, but yeah, it's, I think it's kind of limited what you can glean out of it. And I'd say, look for that in the other interviews where they're more like, you're just talking about the company and your goals and things like that. If you had that sort of feeling, would you bring it up? I probably wouldn't bring it up in the interview, but it would, it would be on my mind for sure. And like I was saying at the start, I always tell people get multiple offers. Like if you're applying to a single place, then they sort of have all the power. Whereas if you have multiple offers, you can go, hmm, well, that guy was a bit rude to me. So I don't know if I want to work there. I might go work at this place. What did you have in mind, Lauren, for like, how do you, how do you glean what it would be like to work there from that sort of interview? I haven't been in very many of them. Also, I've been informed that my audio is terrible. Sorry for that. Um, don't know how to fix it because I can't hear myself. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think, you know, similar to what you've said, like feeling kind of feeling the vibe of it, I guess for me, the style of the interview and the type of problem that they've given me is probably going to tell me quite a lot about whether that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, a place that I, I want to work at and whether they're open to, I'm, I'm probably pretty hard on the side of like, I'll tell people when I don't know something, I'll tell people when I'm feeling discomfort um and 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 be honest about that so if I'm given a task that I really don't know how to do or I'm finding really challenging like I will I will tell them about that and I will maybe try and probe a little bit into you know is this is how how indicative is this of your day-to-day -day or what you're going to expect people to be doing um on the job or like is there something else that we can you know is, is there is even is there somewhere else, something else that we can do for me to show you, um, you know, what mm. my skills are, um, that's going to work for both of us, you know, um, things like that. Um, yeah. I tend to be the type of person who's like, if someone just throws something at me, I, I need a little bit of time, find it really hard to just jump straight into something. Like even, even if yeah. something as simple as fizz buzz, it's like a little bit like, uh, I need to think. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's kind of why I would suggest this BDD approach where you do, you, you think about it beforehand, but you're also clarifying it with the interviewer. It gives you a bit of like breathing room to work through it before you actually get to writing the implementation. And, uh, and yeah, hopefully by the end of it, if you, if you can't nail it down, then it's probably a good point where you ask the interviewer, can we do something else? Yeah. 
yeah it's much better to much better to be upfront about that than just like choking and white knuckling it through the rest of the interview 100 percent. yeah yeah i absolutely agree and i think if you know if i'm not going to get a job because i haven't come across as confident enough then that's fine like <laughs> that the process has probably done its job because I'm not going to come into every day-to-day situation like super confident about everything I'm a more of a like emotions on the sleeve kind of gal so um so yeah that all of those kinds of things um and especially that like uh, sort of disdain or like somebody who really doesn't want to engage or help you um Mm. definitely like those are red flags would be red flags for me you can you can definitely get like a bit of a a little bit of a read on the culture there by like how they treat you in the interview for sure because if everyone's very like respectful and nice and we all love working together blah 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 and you have two people two interviewers sitting in it's usually two it's not usually one person mm. um the the way that they treat you is going to be sort of how they treat people in the team like they, they're going to be acting like they normally act at work basically so keep that in mind and this comes back to, I think, the whole, how do we know what they're expecting? Like, do, do they expect that you're going to pass some technical hurdle or mm-hmm. do they just genuinely know what you want to work with? I feel like it can't hurt just to walk in there and be like, what are your expectations? And, you know, a yeah. good interviewer is going to set those out straight away and be like, we expect that this is going to be production quality code. It's going to be a shopping cart or you're not going to get hired. Well, then you kind of know your battle, you know? And mm. and if they don't lay it out and they're the kind of people that are like, you know, sometimes you go into an interview and they're just like on purpose kind of trick you. Well, I don't want to work there yeah. anyway. If you're setting me up for failure, then that's, yeah. I don't know if I want to hang out with you, you know? 40 hours that's a week it. is a long time to be hanging out with people that are not trying to set me up for success. Interviewing is hard. Like I, I can definitely forgive people for having problems that maybe aren't like the best for the interviewee, but if you ask them like for clarification and they don't give it to you because like, oh, no, we just want to see what you do. And they have some like particular thing in mind that they're waiting for you to do. That's just like, yeah, a huge red flag. Huge red flag. And it yeah. brings me back a little bit to your general, which was just this idea of reframing an interview as a way to show the green flags as opposed to hiding red flags, I guess. Like you want to get as many of those green lights in as you can. Um, And they kind of do too, right? They want you to work for them because it's really an engineer's market at this point. So, Mm -hmm. Um, And I've always liked framing interviewing, like the whole hiring process as um, something like that. Whereas I think, yeah, I think some people really do come in like looking for weakness and like looking for people to make mistakes and looking for the red people as opposed to how do we create a process and facilitate somebody showing us the best parts of themselves, you know? Yeah. Um, and how do we make sure that we see all of that? And maybe we see a little bit of the, you know, their weaknesses and stuff and that's useful information as well, but it's not what we're aiming to see. We're really aiming to see somebody's strengths because that's what you're going to hire them for. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think it's good to have a mix. Like maybe people can choose to do a take home or an in-person because some people just really don't like in-person and they, they could do terrible in that, but they could do really good on the take home one. Yeah. I think it's important to remember that interviewing is an inefficient process and Mm -hmm. good people get rejected for roles and sometimes bad people get into roles. Like it's not a perfect Mm -hmm. process and it's not a judge of your character or your abilities or anything like that. Sometimes the interview just failed to do what it was meant to do. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a numbers game. Yeah. Um, there are definitely things you can do to, to get better at showing these green flags, but uh, yeah, don't take it too personally if a company decides that they don't want to proceed. Yeah. And- I think earlier on in your career, when you don't really know what that hiring process looks like, it's you're more likely to feel like, oh, I, I sucked, I failed or whatever. But later on, like once you've seen how the sausage is made behind the scenes, like I, I would not feel at all bad about being rejected after an interview because I just know like all the ways that this could go terribly wrong and it's not really my fault sort of thing. Yeah, awesome. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Do keep, keep asking questions if you have them, but yeah. Thank you for listening to my talk.